We're going to get started here in a couple minutes. Uh, my name is Mike Robinson. I'm the Senior Deputy Executive Director of the Council of State Governments. And I think Deb asked me to do the introductions here because of my past experience as Medicaid Director in Kentucky. I was Medicaid Commissioner for 24 months. You wonder, well, why did you count in months? Well, the average tenure at the time I left Medicaid for a commissioner was 18 months. That was the national average. It's a high, high turnover uh, situation. And one of the reasons for that is you really don't make any friends as Medicaid commissioner. Um, the providers really don't like you a lot. Um, recipients think that you're just you're being too mean and you know, you're not, not being fair with them. Uh, your staff doesn't like you because you're asking to do more with less every year. And finally, um, just nobody will talk to you. It's, it's, and I've, I've been scarred by that experience for the rest of my life. But Medicaid is a very complex program if you haven't discovered that already. And one of the, the driving forces of this policy academy is to help legislators get a handle on what some of the challenges are. I think Medicaid is the most complex program ever devised by mankind. Uh, it's program within a program. It costs literally billions of dollars. When I left Medicaid in 2003, our budget was $4 billion, and we had over 600,000 recipients. I know there are some states here that have uh, far bigger programs, and in fact, Kentucky's program has grown almost exponentially uh, since 2003. One of the other challenges about Medicaid is it's always changing and evolving. You know, the program that you have today was not the program that I administered 10 years ago, nor the program that was available 20 years ago. Uh, the program is high profile, both at the state level, the federal level. It's probably the biggest budget driver in your all's budgets. Um, I said nobody liked me in state government. Well, my fellow uh, uh, commissioners and secretaries didn't like me either because I was bringing all the, all the extra dollars we had in Kentucky into the Medicaid program in order to meet the demands of the program. You might wonder, well, why is Medicaid so tough? Why is it so difficult to, to manage? And in the era that I was in Medicaid in Kentucky is we were very, very much focused on cost containment, which I'm sure is a phrase that you'll hear over and over again throughout your legislative careers. There's only three ways that you can manage Medicaid costs, and all three are very difficult. One, you can cut reimbursement to providers, which is not very popular. Uh, two, you can reduce the number of participants, but because uh, Medicaid is basically an open-ended entitlement program, it's very difficult to do that. And the third way is to eliminate services. I think, if my memory is correct, there are seven mandatory services in Medicaid and another 20 or 25 optional services. Among the optional services is pharmacy. So even if they're optional services, states have little choice but to provide these services to their recipients. So as you work within the Medicaid community, Please keep in mind some of the challenges that not only face governors and Medicaid commissioners, but face you as you put budgets together. Um, I think right now, um, between Medicaid and education, those are probably the top two programs that uh, you're trying to find funds for in your state. And it's just, um, it's really some tough choices. For those of you that uh, are here, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules. This is the third Medicaid Policy Academy that we have had. Uh, ironically, the, uh, the first one we had in 2012 was the same week that the Supreme Court announced the historic decision on the Affordable Care Act. So you can imagine how exciting and how uh, interesting that week was for our, uh, our participants. So let me just go a little bit in depth in terms of who we are and what we have here today. 
These are the uh, states that are represented. I think there are 19 states represented at today's uh, session. In the past, we've had two other policy academies. And this, these are all the states that have been represented at some point uh, in our programming. Now, we say that CSG is, uh, is sponsoring uh, this policy academy, and we hope that you get a lot out of it. But we wouldn't be able to put these programs on, either this policy academy or others, without our associates. And if you get a chance, uh, we have several representatives from our sponsoring uh, organizations. If they would just stand and so that people know who you are, and uh, if, if you get a chance, uh, talk to these folks at, uh, at the break or tonight at dinner, and let them know how much you appreciate the opportunity to have this program. I think most of the companies that are listed here have, have sponsored in the past. Uh, it seems to have been a very, very popular uh, program, uh, bringing in some uh, excellent speakers. And of course, we want to share as much information with you as possible. The, uh, I'll go back to the beginning comment in that uh, what is the one question about Medicaid that you would want answered before you leave the CSG Medicaid Policy Academy? And, and Deb and Anna are going to take notes, I think, about uh, what your questions are so that during the next couple days we can, in fact, try to address some of those with either question and answers uh, among the speakers. Or a lot of times what I've found in these type of programs is that somebody at dinner tonight may have the answer to your question. And it's a great opportunity to exchange ideas of what is being done in your state and how that your question may be answered. So with that, uh, anybody would like to volunteer to state, their, state your name, the state you're from, and then what's your question? All right, we'll start with this volunteer right here. <laughs> uh, first of all, I didn't volunteer. <laughs> Not to give you too quick an answer, but when we were in Medicaid, we had in our uh, Office of Policy and Budget, we did most of our forecasting based on historical numbers. That was our primary factor that we used to project Medicaid. And then we also knew ahead of time exactly what program enhancements or reductions that we had planned for the biennium, and we tried to factor those in. Now, I don't know if anybody ever gets the Medicaid budget projection totally correct, but that's how we did it, very, very um, um, rudimentary in terms of trying to get a handle on our numbers. But some, uh, some folks here might have a better answer for you. Yes, ma'am. I won't even try that one. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Crawford. I'm a senator from Nebraska and on the Public Human Services Committee in Nebraska. So one thing I want to learn is I want to understand the possibilities for innovation a bit more so we can understand different options that we can try and push in our state. Yeah. I know from my past experience is that CMS has been very uh, generous with some of their waivers. So I think if you... Uh, if you came up with a creative way of, of doing something or providing a service, I, I think they'd be willing to listen. But it's, you know, they, they also are in the same situation that you are in terms of making sure they balance, you know, the demands of the program with the dollars that are available. So, uh, but I, I think they're very receptive to, uh, to waivers. Yes, ma'am. Um, my colleague, 
Um, my question is the connection between Medicaid and ACA and what are the implications and what can we expect, good, bad, or indifferent, what will happen? Now, I'm sure we have some expert uh, speakers coming in, but uh, I think from my perspective, what I see different about ACA and Medicaid is, is the expansion part. It really doesn't change um, the rules that much, although entry level into the program has gone to 133 percent or, or less of poverty. That's different in a lot of states because a lot of states in the past, their eligibility was tied to their old AS, AFDC standards. And particularly in southern states, they're set pretty low. So big change for southern states especially is increase the standard to allow more people into the program. Yes, sir. As I understand it, you know, participating in Medicaid is still at the option of the provider, whether it be, you know, a doctor, dentist, et cetera. So that's going to be a challenge, just like it's a challenge from day one, is for making sure that states provide access to care. I think once we get in a position where we can't provide access to care and providers are not signing up to participate, I think this challenge becomes a, a something that winds up in the courts. Uh, I know some states have actually been sued for lack of access, and I think unless we do something to address your issue, then that could happen more in the future. Yes, sir. That, that's a great question, and I think that's a question that's been overlooked in all the discussion about the Affordable Care Act. Because when you talk about Medicaid, Medicaid is just not a health care provider. It also provides long-term care services. And you're right, as we gray and get older, more and more pressure is going to come to bear on state budgets and people that need the uh, long-term care services. But that's really a good question and one I think that's not really been discussed fully. Yes, sir. That's uh, been a lifelong challenge in terms of trying to manage the cost. Let's go back to the uh, next table there. You want to start, ma'am? Uh, I didn't get to the last part of your question. Right, right. I, I think they can, but I'll leave that to one of our experts. Uh, so I see some nods. And 
that yes, they can. So I, I think that will be a continuing debate um, as more and more pressure comes to states, particularly from the provider community. Uh, I, I think more and more states will actually expand Medicaid. Sir. I'm Jerry Bonnet from Indianapolis, Indiana, with the Indiana Secretary of State's office. Um, it's our intention to have a meeting with the Uh, just a couple of quick responses to that. Uh, I was always frustrated by the waiver process because it took so long. Uh, it would first have to go to the original CMS office, and then once they approved it, or I guess once they approved it, it'd have to go to national for, for interpretation. But um, like I said earlier, I think uh, CMS is, is open to waivers, but they have certain criteria that they have to meet in the program is so complex, sometimes it takes a while to sort through all the issues. Hi, my name is Julie Rocky Adams, and I'm a state representative from rural Kentucky. Mm -hmm. so, um, and I'm only in my second term, and so a lot of these issues are fairly new to me. But we have a governor that um, implemented the exchange and a huge expansion of Medicaid in our state all by executive order. He completely left the legislature out. Now, it's getting ready to come due where we're going to have to pay this bill now that the federal government is backing out. So I think the legislature is trying to play a little bit of catch up here, which is why I'm here um, trying to learn a little bit about this. How are we going to pay for this massive expansion that we had no part in, um, in helping craft? So there's a lot of challenges on our budget already. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, defer that question <laughs> since it's uh, a Kentucky issue. And I, actually, I did have some questions about whether or not the the governor had that authority because. Throughout my government career, I was, was taught or told that the only organization that can appropriate dollars for a program or an expansion is the legislature. And obviously, uh, okay. So we'll, you might be able to help us learn something. Craig? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now, didn't you expand through a waiver through with CMS? I think if you're looking for innovation, I think Arkansas really did a very innovative, uh, good job in terms of implementing the expansion. Thank you. 
Okay. Fifty percent is a huge number. Wow. We, yeah, we we did something similar to that in Kentucky, and uh, found that we did have people on our Medicaid rolls that had that were deceased, and so obviously we we, we took them off. Uh, not that they were utilizing anything, but uh, yeah, could be. Well, you, you bring up a really good topic, and I think that's something that every state needs to take a look at. Go to the middle table, sir. Thank you. Sir? Hi, I'm uh, Chris Dolly. I'm from Virginia, state delegate uh, from Virginia. I'm also a uh, OBGYN physician by training, and um, being a hospital administrator is my real job that uh, I do when we're not in session. So uh, <laughs> Medicaid um, is a big issue. Uh, we have been on a, a very bloody battle in Virginia here for going on six months now over our budget. Um, we're supposed to be out in March, but because of the Medicaid expansion um, issue, uh, our budget was tied up and we we're facing a government shutdown here July 1st. We got a budget out just this last 
Thursday, it uh, does not include Medicaid expansion, so that's going to probably shut it down for at least the next two years to do a two-year budget on the report. So my question is, is, under the limitations of the current Medicaid system, what can and can't you do for those folks that are in coverage? And it seems unclear to me what folks can actually get involved in non enrolled in the current program. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it has to do with the income guidelines of the state and what the uh, eligibility rules are, how they can, is that right? Well, uh, certainly within the state there are income guidelines, but there are certain categories of people that can and cannot be enrolled, and it's still unclear to me whether a chronic illness would count, uh, classify in there as, as one of those categories, age blind, disabled, of course. Right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sue Arrington from Indiana, and my interest is in waivers because the Indiana governor has uh, proposed a waiver that um, we're in the public comment phase, but I think we're nearly uh, finished with that, and we'll be submitting it to uh, the May. And it looks a lot like the Medicaid expansion, but it does have a couple of differences. One of them is uh, a medical savings account uh, aspect. And the other one uh, has to do with people who are actually working but can't afford it. their company insurance. It would help them pay for that through Medicaid. So I guess my question really is how likely is something that requires you know, the participants to pay something how likely is that to be approved? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Christine Perry. I'm a representative from Idaho. I serve on the Health and Welfare uh, Committee on the House side. And uh, one of the questions that I have that I'd like to look at is how Medicaid can be utilized in our kind of behavioral health field. We're making some big changes from substance abuse and mental health and coordinating those two. But I also want to look at how does that relate to our prison population? Because what I have does is once you have been released from prison, and 30% of the people in prison have mm -hmm. these uh, behavioral health issues, we give them 30 days worth of medication and say good luck. And uh, because we don't cover the general population under our Medicaid, I'm interested if we could possibly cover just that population for a certain amount of time after they get out without having to expand it to the whole population. So that's just as a point of information, there's another policy academy going on simultaneously that has to do with workforce development. And one of the subgroups is focused on uh, corrections and criminal justice, how we can do a better job in moving the inmate into the medical system as quickly as possible so that they don't have that breakdown and wind up back in prison. So you might be interested in following up with some of those folks who are attending that policy academy. Sir? Thank you. Uh, Dan Johnson, uh, State of Idaho, Senate, uh, serving the Finance Committee, and other committees, sir. But uh, I guess sometimes I feel like what we're being asked to do is split the baby, and that's a tough decision to make. Because uh, we want to help folks that need help, but at the same uh, time, you can't afford to just buy this if everyone's just not going to have it. So uh, I'm really a numbers person, and one of the things that I like to look at is to see if there's some businesses that we can make the current system Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. That's a great question. I can't answer it, but maybe one of our speakers can answer it later. Uh, let's. 
Next uh, question. Go ahead. Um, my name is uh, Matt Hudson. I'm a representative of Florida. I uh, chair the Health Care Appropriations Committee in our state. Uh, our Medicaid uh, uh, population is about 3.5 million in Florida. Our spend is about 23 billion. Uh, I think one of the authors of our Medicaid reform uh, pilot program that's uh, being rolled out right now. My biggest, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a specific question related to uh, Medicaid. Sits. I think there probably uh, needs to be some time frames with the processing of 1915 waivers and actually putting some finite time frames on those so that people can plan appropriately budget, especially that are in right. two year budget cycles, and then also maybe a modernization of the uh, formula and algorithm to create the F map. Because it hurts states that are hurricane prone because it's based on an average income. And after a hurricane, we've got more disposable income, right. which raises our income. Okay, thank you. Did, did you have a question, sir? Uh, sure. I want to respond to the one that's asking Oh, yeah, if you have a question, go ahead. Well, one thing I'm looking to learn is that you have the 80 20 rule, and I think when it comes to Medicaid, sometimes it's not even that. You have 15 to 10% of your population, maybe 90% of your spend. Um, it's not a one size fits all, so I'll be interested in hearing how states are looking at certain crime disease states, behavioral health, uh, bill eligibles. Are you going to have coordinated care plans for those types of individuals where you can control the spend but also give them the quality of care that they deserve? I think a lot of states have tried to uh, focus in on those uh, uh, heavy utilizers of Medicaid dollars and you know, gone to some type of case management system that uh, kind of tries to coordinate all the services um, and then provide that to the individual. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir? Hi, I'm Isaac Lyrell. I'm representative of District 6 in South Dakota. And Senator Craig Teason mentioned it earlier that we have not had uh, CMS approve our Medicaid waiver. We, our governor, proposed being able to expand Medicaid and giving us more control. And I guess my question is, we have many states, red and blue states, that I think we should be able to agree on localized decision making for something as complex as healthcare delivery. And if we can achieve better outcomes with the same number of dollars, then why not at least give states the choice to try it? If you can care for more people, if you can provide better outcomes, why the scrutiny from a centralized decision maker to you can't try your program, you can try your program? I think we should all let states get together and say, let us have waivers, not just for Medicaid expansion, but for Medicaid as a whole, because we want to try different things. We want to care for people. So trust us to make those decisions locally. And I, I guess that's my question. Why can't all states, bipartisan, get together and say, let's, let's make more decisions locally? Okay. Thank you. Let's go to the back table here. Where we have five critical care hospitals that are all teetering on the on the brink. 
So those are the questions I'd like to see answered. And also, I would appreciate the uh, question on the uh, prison population, because we are, we're dealing with some of the same things in Nebraska, right. overpopulation of the prison system, and kind of revolves more over the people that get off their beds and end up back. Okay. I'm Teddy Walker. I'm a state representative from Mississippi. Uh, actually arrived early for a different conference. <laughs> uh, I'm sure today. I might chair our public health committee and also on Medicaid and appropriations. Uh, the question I had is a lot of our Medicaid population is starting to shift more to managed care. We've raised our ceiling this year uh, to also include children, uh, especially the kids that are going to come in the Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act and wait for shift. Uh, however, the conversation on managed care always comes down to how it's reducing cost. Uh, we very rarely have a conversation or any sort of metrics or benchmarks on how we improve the health outcomes of the problem. And so uh, I would be interested to know are there some best practices on, uh, we have Centene and United are our two uh, vendors that do managed care in our state. Uh, are there some best practices or benchmarks that we should be applying to those contracts to make sure we're not only you know, getting cost savings, but we're also getting quality Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. No? Hi, I'm April Alexander. I work for Family Health Care and I'm the sponsors here. Um, I have many questions about Medicaid, and I should probably know all the answers because I work for a Medicaid health plan. But um, one thing that I think states are struggling with is um, looking at the cost of dual eligibles and trying to create a program that, um, that really, truly integrates the, the, two, the Medicare and Medicaid program. And one of the challenges that I've seen is trying to get the two divisions of CMS to talk to each other and trust each other on between Medicaid and Medicare. And I think this also, uh, these problems are, are reflected in the waiver situation that you all have been uh, talking about. But that's, a, that's an area that I feel like there could be a change there. We could get the two CMS divisions to really talk to each other and understand how the programs work and get kind of the Medicare folks to move off from each other. Older rules and to be innovative, that you know, if we could do that, that would be really great. I think it would help a lot of states. Okay. Uh, Gary, do you have any questions? You have a question? Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Gary Blaylock. I'm with GlaxoSmith Klein out of Tennessee. We uh, had one of the original waivers back in the early 90s called, called Key Cares. It had finally advanced it throughout the decades. And uh, we have not expected our Medicaid program. Our governor is looking at what Arkansas has done to use uh, federal dollars to buy on private exchange. But uh, he is still in negotiation with HHS. One thing, though, that I'm seeing, in fact, Arkansas just announced that they're uh, doing a collaboration with a group out of North Carolina to answer the COVID question and, uh, and others on the, uh, the quality issues. We are It'd be great if we move away from the people service. Our healthcare system is based upon volume. Instead, now we should be moving toward um, clinical outcomes. And that's where <clears throat> Arkansas has joined hands with a group out of Raleigh, North Carolina, called Community Care of North Carolina. They do a lot of medical home. They do a lot with Medicaid patients. They do a lot, even now it's innovative, they're doing it with Medicare patients. My own company now, their employees are now involved in this. It's a medical problem, but it goes beyond that. It goes to the point of benchmarks, best outcomes, identifying the chronic care, you know, the high cost. Right. And that's what I think a lot of the states now, excuse me, are uh, looking at now. You've had med medical homes, now you've got to take it to the next step. Go for the clinical outcomes. That's where you will save your dollars. Okay. Joe, anything? Uh, I'll go real quick. Uh, Joe Boros from Barron Green uh, based out of Connecticut. Uh, just to echo some of the other comments, is to really learn about some of the best practices that other states have uh, been implementing around uh, Medicaid in terms of cost savings. Um, one of the big one of the that we'd like to hear. I know uh, some of my friends this past year have done some things uh, which we're hopeful uh, to be a partner with to look at how states can save money around some of the, the high utilizers. Okay, thank you. I'm um, Leslie Snyder from the Forest Laboratories. Excuse my voice and allergies this season. But I just want to say thank you to CSG for uh, giving the Forest Laboratories an opportunity to sponsor these academies. Fantastic. I really am so pleased to see so many of uh, the policymakers here. I know you have so many complexities in your states. You look at other best practices from others. 
Thanks, Deb. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to wrap up this session right now. Um, I've been very, very impressed with the, the quality and the level of questions that you have. I think uh, you can tell that almost everybody in the room has something different to offer in terms of their knowledge and experience with the Medicaid program. And I think this will be a great discussion for dinner time or break time to get with somebody who has a specific issue or has an idea that you think can benefit your state. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, Paul Diagardi, uh, serves as the director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in his capacity, he provides advice to new secretary, Sylvia Burwell, on working with governmental and non-governmental stakeholders across the country. This includes strategic planning and implementation on a range of high-priority policies, programs, and initiatives. He manages a team of over 60 regional and Washington, D.C.-based HHS officials. Paul is responsible for overseeing the department's engagement with state, local, territorial, and tribal governments, as well as private sector businesses, nonprofit organizations, and other external partners. He has been directly involved in the implementation of major Obama administration priorities, such as the Affordable Care Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and numerous other health care, public health, and human service programs. Paul has over 20 years' experience working in issue advocacy, political strategy, grassroots organizing, management, and government. He began his career working for the late Senator Edward M. Kennedy, since then, he has worked extensively with elected officials. Paul is originally from Bayville, New York. He received a BA in political science from Boston College and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University. I can only imagine, just based on some of your questions, how challenging Paul's job is. I want to uh, personally thank him and on behalf of CSG, thank him for taking time to spend with us and to address some of your concerns. Paul, thank you. Great, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to uh, CHG for uh, inviting me here, and thanks to all of the um, policymakers and partners in, in the room. Um, <clears throat> this I took a look at the agenda. It seems like a really great couple of days uh, to engage uh, on an issue. Uh, it's very important to our work um, at HHS, which is the Affordable Care Act and uh, Medicaid in particular. So given what I heard from all the, the questions going around the room, um, I think I'd more than anything like to engage in, in some, some dialogue and hopefully I can get at some of the questions uh, you raised and, and get, get you some answers uh, right off the, the bat here. Um, but let me start out by just um, giving you a bit of an overview from uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, sort of uh, what we do, what we're working on now, and, uh, you know, sort of a, a status update as to where we are with the Affordable Care Act, um, especially uh, Medicaid program. Um, so obviously the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is a huge place. We're, we're spending a lot of time right now implementing the Affordable Care Act. We uh, work across a number, uh, range of issues uh, in the healthcare realm, but also in the public health realm, uh, FDA issues, CDC issues, things like that, as well as the human services side. So programs you may be familiar with, uh, child care, uh, Head Start, foster care, things like that, also uh, fall under our purview. But um, obviously since um, March of 2010, over the past four plus years, we've been working to, uh, to implement the Affordable Care Act. I think many of you have obviously been following that very closely. Um, I think what you've seen over the, the rollout and the implementation of, of the law over the past four years is it sort of fell into um, two distinct phases. The first phase being some of the insurance protections, uh, the consumer protections that were put in place early on, things like the ban on the pre-existing conditions um, for children, ban on lifetime limits, uh, sort of um, uh, 
regulating the way in which uh, insurance companies spend uh, their premium dollars on medical services versus uh, overhead. Um, so all those things that sort of uh, helped correct some of the, uh, the abuses within the private insurance market uh, and help provide some protection to, um, to folks who have that coverage. What we've seen really over the past year, and, and particularly since January 1st of this year, is the, uh, the coverage expansion. So trying to bring more people uh, who didn't previously have insurance or who had substandard insurance, getting them coverage bringing them into um, the health insurance uh, coverage marketplace um, and to get more people uh, into the system. Um, that, as you know, sort of fell into two, uh, two mechanisms by which people could get health insurance coverage, one being the health insurance marketplaces or exchanges. Uh, those uh, went online uh, uh, late last year. Coverage began January 1st of this year. So that's going on to healthcare.gov or your state-based marketplace website, purchasing a private plan, getting a, um, a federal premium tax credit to subsidize that coverage. Um, the other, you know, really other half of that coverage expansion is, is the topic we're talking about here today, and that's the, um, the Medicaid expansion. Um, I think everybody's probably pretty familiar with the, the general parameters of, of the expansion in the Affordable Care Act. Um, it provides for uh, Medicaid coverage up to 133 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, just to give you a sense of those figures, that's about $15,000 for a single individual in yearly income or uh, $20,600 for, uh, for a married couple. Uh, in yearly income. Um, as has been discussed, the uh, Supreme Court made the uh, expansion of Medicaid a state-by-state state, uh, decision. Uh, so far, we've got about um, 26 states in the District of Columbia who have opted into that and are in that expansion now. Um, so about half and half in terms of states that, uh, that have expanded and haven't expanded. Um, and um, as was mentioned earlier, we've got the 100% federal match uh, in the first three years. That's the first three calendar years, so 2014, uh, 2015, and 2016. Then it ratchets down to 90%, uh, you know, 90-10 uh, federal state match uh, after that. Um, states can expand any time, and as, as we've been discussing, um, many states are still going through that decision-making process. Uh, that 100% match isn't for the first three years, it's for those first three calendar years. So the longer you wait to expand, the less years of 100% federal match uh, you're, you're going to get. Um, it is optional um, both to come in at any time and to go out uh, at any time. We've, we've been clear about that. We've put out some guidance stating that um, you can drop your expansion any time and um, uh, has no effect on your uh, underlying Medicaid program. What the Supreme Court ruling effectively did was to make the uh, traditional Medicaid, if you want to call it that, one program and the Medicaid expansion sort of a separate program. So the two are not linked for purposes of, um, of federal, federal matching. So I know that's been a, a big question and happy to um, address that uh, even further. Uh, you probably saw some of the headlines about the take-up rates of the coverage expansion. We had about uh, 8 million people enroll into the private coverage through the insurance marketplaces. Uh, you know, estimates are about uh, uh, over 6 million people uh, have enrolled in Medicaid. That's not just the expansion population. That's the net increase in uh, Medicaid enrollment nationally over a baseline of about this time last year. Uh, and we've also seen the uh, rate of uninsurance as measured by um, Gallup and others uh, drop. So it's not just the same people sort of churning around to different coverage. Uh, it is actually a net, uh, significant net reduction in the level of uninsurance uh, nationally since the beginning of this year. So we are beginning to see uh, the coverage expansion have its uh, intended consequence uh, of the law. Um, so I'd really like to get into some of the other topics that were raised here, uh, some of the options available to states. Um, we've seen most states just adopt a, what we call a standard Medicaid expansion where they just change the uh, income eligibility level up to 133 percent of poverty and then roll everybody into their existing Medicaid program. Um, but there are more and more states, and some were mentioned earlier, who um, have implemented or are looking at um, some more innovative models, and we definitely want to work on a state-by-state -state level to uh, encourage some of those uh, state-based options. Um, uh, Arkansas, as you've probably heard, um, has uh, transformed their entire uh, Medicaid program into one based on premium subsidies into the private market, both the old uh, Medicaid population and the expansion uh, population. That was a very innovative idea that they uh, came to us with, and we worked out the details with them. We were able to uh, approve that model. Uh, it's being implemented quite successfully now. Um, 
you, uh, some of the other states were mentioned and maybe some of the states that you, you come from. Um, Iowa did a similar thing to, uh, to what Arkansas did uh, with the premium uh, subsidy, the private option model, but also built in uh, some of the other options about um, cost sharing and uh, reward incentives for, for uh, behavior changes, for healthy lifestyles and uh, things like that. A uh, similar thing went on in, uh, in Michigan where they took some of the elements of Iowa and Arkansas, combined it together into their own model. And as was mentioned earlier, we're in conversations right now with states like um, Indiana and Pennsylvania and others to try to craft um, a state-specific solution. So we are very open to um, ideas. Our goal at the end of the day is to um, get people into coverage, um, but we're also very interested in, in ideas that states have about uh, improving the delivery system, uh, reducing costs, increasing quality, um, and so we very much are uh, not intending to take a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. Uh, we want to uh, test what works. Uh, we know that the um, you know, one of the uh, uh, most important goals of the Affordable Care Act is to bend the overall cost curve in the uh, rate of increase of health care spending nationally, uh, not just in the, you know, the government side, but also in the, the private side. Um, the rate of increase, as I think everybody knows, has been unsustainable, you know, over the past uh, 10 years or so and obviously has a huge impact on, on state budgets, but also has been having uh, uh, an impact on federal budgets. I think fortunately what we've seen, I think due to a num number of factors, uh, not the least of which are, are some of the realignments in the Affordable Care Act, is that that cost curve is starting to bend. Um, this early on, we're starting to see evidence of that. Um, on the government side, the Medicare costs, the, uh, the rate of increase in, in Medicare spending um, has uh, leveled off um, and is, is lower than the rate of increase in previous years. And we're even seeing now in the uh, Medicaid program, uh, per capita uh, Medicaid, per enrollee spending in Medicaid is actually starting to come down as well. So some very encouraging signs. I think that's a combination of some of the innovations in the Affordable Care Act, the coverage expansion, but also a lot of the new and very exciting uh, innovations that are being put in place both by private insurers and uh, providers, as well as some of these innovations we're seeing at, at the state level. So there's actually a whole um, uh, section of the Affordable Care Act that's devoted to encouraging some of these. We've established the um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation. Um, many of you may be from states who have uh, received a uh, state innovation grant to start testing some of these models. Um, these are things that we really want to test and, uh, and, and bring to scale and try to find ways of delivering care to as many people as possible, but really uh, lowering the cost and increasing the quality and improving outcomes because at the end of the day, it's about uh, making people um, healthier um, and happier uh, and living longer lives. And so, you know, this isn't just about sort of, um, you know, bringing health care to more people or you know, bringing more federal money to the table to, to spend on health care. Uh, it is about transforming the entire system to get um, at some of these uh, quality outcomes that I think we all um, agree are uh, urgently needed. So um, just wanted to give you that uh, sense of overview. Um, I know there are a couple of uh, questions that were raised that are sort of directly related to our work and our policy and our decisions made here at the, the federal level at HHS. So happy to take that on and answer some of those questions uh, if you want to re-ask any of them. Um, and uh, also interested to hear your, your thoughts and feedbacks and your perspective from, from where you said about um, how it's going and things that we can do to uh, improve the implementation of the, the Medicaid program and the Affordable Care Act more broadly uh, moving forward. So happy to get questions or feedback. Yes. Uh, there hasn't been a, no, there, I mean, we just started, you know, January 1st of this year, so there hasn't been any state that's uh, pulled back from, from the expansion, but we've, we've put that out there in writing, and um, the, the Roberts ruling very clearly uh, segregated the two programs, so the uh, legal rationale by which uh, the Supreme Court made the expansion optional 
uh, for states to get in is the same rationale to, that applies to them coming out in, in terms of at least its effect on the underlying Medicaid program. The whole basis of the lawsuit on the Medicaid expansion was the fact that we were coercing states. The Affordable Care Act coerced states by threatening their underlying Medicaid program. And the Supreme Court said that's, that's, that is actually coercion. You can't threaten states with their underlying Medicaid funding uh, for not taking the expansion. So that same logic for whether or not you can get in does apply for whether or not you uh, can get out. And we've, um, you know, we've put that out in, in writing uh, several times since, since the Supreme Court ruled. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. And uh, it is something that we have approved, uh, and Iowa is a, is a good example of that. Um, there are some um, statutory limitations, particularly for the population that's below 100% of poverty. Even then, there, there are some nominal copays that you could charge for things like non-emergency use of an emergency room or uh, not using generic drugs uh, when they're available. So, you know, where, where there are alternatives, you can, you know, you can force people to um, have to pay a copay in those situations. Um, above 100% of poverty, so for Medicaid expansion, it'd be between 100 and 133%. There actually is a lot more uh, flexibility, and you can see in Arkansas where they're actually charging a premium uh, for that population. Um, that same authority could be used for things like copays or surrogates. So, so you know, cost sharing either on the premium side or on the copay side is permitted, again, within some boundaries, but when you get above 100% of poverty, um, you know, our goal is to make that, make that look a lot, a lot more like private insurance where there are premiums and copayments because we expect there'll be a lot of churn between the um, Medicaid coverage population and the, and the private market side. So what Arkansas did is sort of try to mirror that population once you get above poverty. Below 100% of uh, the poverty level, uh, the law is a, a lot more restrictive, and so we have a lot less authority to do that. But yes, premiums, copays, uh, other cost sharing incentives or things that states like um, Arkansas and Iowa and others have built into their expansion program. Paul, but is there any way to put any teeth into that? Because the reality of what happens is that just ends up being a loss suffered by the provider if they don't pay it. So is there anything out there that puts some, some teeth in being able to do a copay? Well, I think the, the, the teeth of having a, a copay is that it's something you, you would owe. It'd be debt that you, you would, uh, the individual would have to owe. Um, you know, you can't, it's not a situation where we can um, uh, kick people off of coverage because that sort of would defeat the purpose of expanding the coverage to begin with. Um, but you can build in incentives to encourage people to, um, to pay those fees, to pay those, uh, those copays. Um, and again, as you get above 100% of poverty, there is a little bit more ability of teeth for, for people to be uh, denied coverage or to be denied services or to owe that debt. And again, below poverty, it's, it's a little more um, uh, difficult to do that because the law is very prescriptive. So again, you know, um, what Arkansas did and what Iowa did is, um, you know, pretty good models to look at in terms of uh, what you can, you know, what sort of uh, um, ability you have to charge people and make them responsible for, for those uh, cost sharing provisions. Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, I don't off the top of my head, um, you know, um, there are many states who, both in the Medicaid program and in the uh, exchange, in their essential health benefits on the exchange, it did allow for uh, adult dental to be sort of a separate standalone product. Um, pediatric dental is uh, permitted to be included into the, the benchmark package. I don't have a, a breakdown of which states have, uh, have exercised those options, but that, we can get you that information. Uh, well, that that's actually one of the one of the provisions that we are in conversation with uh, Indiana about now. It's the lockout period where you wouldn't be allowed in for that time, and I think um, we have some questions about how that would be um, structured because you, you know uh, you put people off of the coverage, they still you know 
then that just drives them to the emergency room if they need the coverage. And so, you know, we don't feel the uh, booting them off of coverage is a good way to incentivize them to keep paying them, but um, we're trying to figure out with them ways of which that we can um, make that responsibility, um, you know, more, uh, more binding and sort of, um, you know, forcing them to uh, participate in the program in that way. So we haven't, that is um, one of the provisions we're in conversations with Indiana about, and in terms of, like you said, where that would fall on the poverty level it's you know easier to do things like that above 100 percent versus below 100 percent um but that you know we haven't approved the indiana waiver uh, you know at all yet but certainly that lockout period is one thing we're in conversations with them about Um, that decision was, was based on uh, our reading of the law, which that 100% match was explicitly tied to the, the um, new adult population, we call it, which was defined as going up to 133% of poverty. So, you know, we didn't do that. There was any flexibility in, in the law to do that. So that was as much of a legal decision as it was uh, a policy decision. And I think for a state um, and for us, it certainly, um, we think, op would open you up to uh, a significant legal exposure if you were to deny people, uh, if you do a partial expansion. Whoop, whoop, sorry. Uh, and very emphatic about that. Um, and, uh, and only do that, that uh, partial match. We don't think that that's in compliance with the law. And we also believe a 100% match is very generous, as is 90% uh, moving forward. But you know, we certainly have heard that that feedback from uh, from states. Um, well, I, when, when, when you talk about the uh, Medicaid money going to states, I mean, it is based on your cost. It's based match on your, your actual cost. So if you're experienced, if you have an, an aging population and they're accessing more services, you get reimbursed at whatever match rate for, for those services. So states with an aging population would actually have uh, more Medicaid uh, funding flowing, flowing into them. Oh, you're just talking about the overall projections for the cost of the Medicaid program moving forward? I'm mostly concerned with the yeah. state looks at its exposure to its, uh, its aging population based on what the federal government is saying we will augment the money. Have you planned for that going out further? Sure, and I, I think that would be based on the, the scoring of the program overall, of what we anticipated. Uh, you know, the Congressional Budget Office, the uh, General Accounting Office had projected as the cost of the Medicaid program over 10 years. And so they, when they did their 10-year score, they certainly took into account the um, characteristics of, of the populations who would, be, who would be covered by that program. So that, you know, projection, projections are projections, but it is based on sort of the um, information we have about the historic cost of the, the program for different populations. Or 
significantly reduce on the other parts of your budget. And I think so the question is, has anybody thought about, I'm mean, sure they thought about it, but in terms of HHS, I know you're focused on Medicaid, but your the growth rate for Medicaid is going up and up, and it's just going to continue to go up, regardless of all the different um, cost contained issues that are put in place. Well, I, I think we, as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, very, very serious. Um, and in fact, this will be one of the primary um, areas that we look at uh, moving forward. Now, it's sort of the core provisions of the Affordable Care Act have been implemented. Are these different cost containment strategies? You mentioned the grading of the population that brings in Medicare as well, which is you know, and integrating uh, Medicaid and Medicare, looking at uh, dual eligibles, looking at providing um, uh, different sorts of um, innovations within uh, the Medicare program, allowing more state, allowing states to um, have the flexibility to look at all payer models, so Medicare, Medicaid, uh, state employees, and even bringing the, the, the private payers to the table about how do we change the healthcare delivery system? How do we move from the fee for service model into one that looks at um, total healthcare, total wellness, uh, better outcomes at, at lower cost? So that is a top, top priority for us. I think that is the only way that we're ever going to be able to um, get at that um, uh, increase in the cost curve. Um, and I think we are already starting to learn and understand um, what works, what is working, and we need to um, analyze that, measure that, and then um, take it to scale. And I think states will play a very important role at um, engaging in some of those different experiments, those different models, so that we can then um, spread those across different states. So certainly I think you'll, you'll see over the next several years um, that will be a major uh, focus of ours is um, that cost containment, better care, you know, better quality at uh, lower cost, not only because it's, it's you know, the right thing to do to give, give, give people better health care, but it certainly gets at that underlying um, budget issue. I mean, you look at the per capita spend of uh, the United States versus any other um, developed country, and we're, you know, we're way off the charts, and our, our outcomes are not necessarily as, as good. And so um, I think there's a, there's a lot of savings that uh, are available within the system, and I think we can do that through some um, very innovative strategies. And I said earlier, we are already starting, even with you know, the beginnings of some of these uh, new strategies put in place, we are starting to see those, those cost curves um, come under control. You know, not in the way we'd like to see over the long term, but I think we're encouraged by the initial evidence of, of uh, what works and what is effective at getting to that very point. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, I think uh, long-term care is, is part of the broader category of the, you know, sort of high utilizers. Um, so um, the dual eligible population, people who may be um, disabled or have chronic conditions, some of which, you know, lead them to end up in, in a long-term care situation. Um, we're looking at a whole array of things, uh, both on the dual eligible side, better coordination between Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, as mentioned earlier, that the establishment of a, a medical home, coordination of care, um, I think taking a more um, you know, holistic look at the different things that um, uh, lead to people to uh, end up in chronic situations, um, you know, things like home visitation and things like that, allowing those things earlier on in the process, and really moving from sort of a, you know, a, a sick care um, system into a, you know, a well care system. Um, so I really think you have to approach that from, from all different angles, not both, you know, what do you do with something once they end up with a, a chronic condition or a disability or in a long-term care situation, but what are the steps you can take um, earlier on um, through better coordination and better strategies to uh, prevent them from ending up in that situation. So you really have to look at it from, from all angles. Can that be changed? How often can that be changed? And what are the types of things? 
Well, it, it will depend on the terms of, of, of the waiver. And, uh, you know, most waivers are, um, are multi-year and there are opportunities for, for renewal. And so I think that would depend on sort of, you know, what sort of uh, program you're looking at. Um, you know, Oregon uh, last year was approved for a huge and significant um, waiver that really transforms their, their whole system and, and brings them into this um, getting off the fee-for-service and into sort of more of an all-payer model. It's a five-year waiver. There are benchmarks that they have to meet every year and a lot of things, but this would all be in writing and built into the waiver. So if you were to come in next year for a five-year waiver, um, you know, as long as you're hitting your benchmarks, you're holding up your end of the deal, I think, you know, legally there's, there's not much that um, any new administration or new leadership could, could do to uh, undo that. I guess, you know, congressional action uh, signed into law by the president, you know, outlawing the Medicaid program or, you know, whatever, I mean, certainly that, but I think, you know, any, any waiver you put in place is, is effectively a contract. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, if there were a provision that a court ruled was, was you know, uh, not permissible authority of the state or the federal government that was built into that, I mean, there's always the risk of those sorts of things, but I think it's less of a uh, situation of change in political leadership and more sort of what are, what are the terms of your waiver. Now, once your waiver expires and you have to come in to renew, then, you know, we can't really make any commitments about that. So, so a couple clarifying points on that. That only applies to um, employers who uh, participate in the small business uh, exchange, the shop exchange, so they get their insurance uh, through there. And what that um, guidance we put out last week had to do with uh, choices that the employee would have, not what the employer would have. So it's a question of whether the employer can go on to the small business exchange they can, the employer can choose from, choose from uh, getting emphatic again, the employer can choose from multiple plans and then say to their employees, here is the plan available to you that you can, um, that you can utilize um, to purchase through, through us. And so I think this is very uh, much just sort of a, a transition phase as we build out the small business uh, exchange. Um, we did allow states to um, determine how they would like to um, have that option. So it was the decision of the state of Arizona to um, not allow for what we call employee choice uh, for one year. And I think it's something we will revisit um, next year. But we're just trying to uh, smooth the transition within each state. Each state's, you know, as you know, the insurance market in each state is very different. And we want to give the state some flexibility to, to smooth the transition uh, from, you know, one set of plans to another. But it's not, uh, you know, I think it's important to note this is about the uh, choice of plans that employees would have uh, for employers that are in the, the small business exchange, not the choice of plans for the employer. Other questions? Um, well, I, I think uh, an important thing to note, no, no, I, I, but I understand the issue you're getting at, and it's an important one. I think one important thing to note is that um, as a result of the um, Affordable Care Act and the mental health parity law, um, uh, providing uh, mental health services, behavioral health services are, are now sort of a required part of, of, 
um, an insurance package. And so what that is, uh, the goal of that is to really get um, at some of these uh, more comprehensive approach to health care and understanding that behavioral health, substance abuse, you know, uh, mental health um, do affect physical health. And so, um, you know, those are services that, um, that, that now can be provided. I think that's the biggest way, particularly if you do have a Medicaid expansion, of being able to provide those types of services to those populations, particularly someone coming out of prison. We've seen um, uh, several states that have expanded Medicaid um, as they're discharging uh, inmates from prison. They're enrolling them in the Medicaid program to make sure that they are getting health care, and they view that, I think, you know, something we'll, we'll have to see how that um, measures out over time, but they view that as a, you know, a very important way of um, tr lowering the recidivism rate, having someone um, um, get health care when, when, they, when they walk out the door. Um, that's, that's really only possible in a state where, where you have um, the Medicaid expansion unless, you know, someone coming out has, has some level of income, but usually, usually they don't. So it is a strategy that uh, many expansion states are employing to try to get at the very question you're addressing. Well, um, I mean, I guess effectively that is what's happening. I mean, the money to fund the expansion is coming into the uh, the treasury, and states that have expanded are are drawing down that that match. Now there is a limit to how much a state can draw down based on your your, your Medicaid claim. So I mean, effectively, it's true. You, you know, we have states bordering each other, or one state is getting that federal match, and the other state isn't. So. Yeah, that money is going into into that uh, that other state, but you know the money is there for other states who who want to come in and and expand. So, given the answer you gave with regard to the recidivism question that was over here, um, and realizing you're only a few months into this, but how soon will we have data on that that will show what, how this is working in, this, in these states that have expanded? I mean, you said it. I mean, we're a couple months in. I mean, I think for states, um, uh, you, you know, both the benefit and the expansion were sort of in place as of January 1st. And, you know, I know it is something that, that states who are aggressively uh, enrolling inmates in, in Medicaid are taking a hard look at. So, you know, uh, hopefully over the course of the next year, we start to begin to see some data on that. Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head which states have sort of uh, an aggressive program for enrolling people. I, I do know it's something that Illinois is uh, looking at, um, and they have a program in place. Um, I'm not sure what New York and California specifically are doing uh, on that, but I think those are probably two other states to look at. They're doing a lot of innovative things on, uh, on inmates and uh, the behavioral health side as well. Um, so I'm sure there'll be a lot more information coming out on, on um, you know, data coming out on that as we get deeper into the coverage expansion. Can I challenge you on that question you gave over here? Sure. The fewer states that participate does not increase the amount of money the other states get. Yeah, like I said, there's a, there's a limit. You can, you can only draw down as much money as you, you submit so claims for. The state gets as much money as they're eligible to get. They don't get somebody else's money. The federal deficit may go down, but other states don't get another state's money. That's right. The, the money for the other states is still there. You know, waiting for you effectively. So we're borrowing less money as a nation rather than other states borrow. Yeah, I, it depends on how you how you want to look at it. I mean, yeah, it, well, we're not bar, we're not borrowing it. Uh, we're not borrowing more money insofar as the Affordable Care Act because the Affordable Care Act is uh, funded completely, but within the law, it is. Uh, fully paid for. So you could say that money that uh, comes in to fund the Affordable Care Act, you know, that is not going out to other states, could then be used for, for other purposes, including lower than deficit. But that, that money comes into the Treasury for the purposes of funding the Affordable Care Act and, and funding the Medicaid expansion, and it's not going out for that purpose. So, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's very, very, very important point is that uh, the 
the Affordable Care Act was written with the funding provisions built into it. So when the law was passed and, and signed into law, um, those funding provisions uh, came into effect, both the, on the cost saving side, uh, reductions in you know savings and other programs, uh, as well as the the revenue side, and uh, it was structured in a way at the Congressional Budget Office when the law was passed. Um, said that over 10 years, the ACA fully impl implemented would actually reduce the deficit uh, by several hundred million dollars. So I, that that's an important point to note, and. Um, you know, those funding provisions are there, the revenue is coming in, and whether or not it's utilized for funding anticipated costs of the ACA is, you know, sort of a separate question. Correct. Yeah, the, 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 the law was, was, was passed with a Congressional Budget Office score that projected over the, you know, the 10 year, the CBO does 10 year scoring over the 10 years, it would reduce the deficit by, uh, you know, a couple hundred million dollars. And so, like I said, so if, you know, money is coming in, cost savings are being, um, you know, are, are being received, and if that money is not going out the door for Medicaid expansion or anything else, it's, it's not being used for the purpose that it was intended for uh, in the law. So, so the story we hear about the Affordable Care Act not being affordable, is it, are those not accurate? Or, because what we hear is it's costing a lot more than they projected. Now, I mean, it, it, it certainly uh, costs a lot of money, but it's, it's funded within the law. I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the entire, there were cost savings and funding provisions that passed with of uh, the things that cost money. So it all all went as a package intended to fund itself. Um, and, you know, things change. And like I said, if, as the cost curve is bent, as we're seeing lower costs per capita in Medicaid, the savings of the, to the deficit of the ACA is actually going to increase as we're bending that cost curve. One last point. So if that changes, will, will that be reconciled by raising the premium tax from 3.5%? And, and that would require, a, you know, and. Congress every year, as you know, you know, messes with the budget. So, um, but we have not seen, you know, uh, cost projections uh, yet that um, you know call for any change in, in any of the funding mechanisms of, of the ACA. Excuse me. Uh, so one, one was mentioned, there's a uh, uh, health insurance tax on various types of plan um, above certain levels of, of income. Uh, there is uh, savings incurred, significant savings incurred on the uh, reimbursement rates provided to private insurers who participate in the uh, Medicare uh, Advantage plans. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a combination of both uh, revenue and savings that, uh, you know, pay for the projected costs and then do uh, provide actually some deficit reduction uh, in the end. So it's a combination of both. Okay, one more question. Well, I, you know, I'll, I, 
I can't give you a crystal ball 10 years into the future. Uh, the 90% match is there. I think you would have to do your own uh, projections at the state level as to what a you know 10% um, share of the expansion population would do. Well, all I can provide you with is what is in the law, and the 10% the, the match is, is in the law in perpetuity. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, if Congress wants to come along and lower that at some point, that they could do that. They could also increase it. You know, they could also make it 100% in perpetuity. So you've got a, you know, a law that's written, um, you know, with a 10-year horizon in terms of costs and, and revenues and all of that, I think you, you said it, your, your state is exercising um, its uh, flexibility by saying if anything changes and we find it's unsustainable, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cut it off and we're going to pull back on our expansion. That's something the governor was very explicit about when he got into it, and that's great. I mean, if that's what works best for you, then that option's available to you and uh, you are exercising it. The one other thing I do, I do want to mention which gets to this point, and it was raised earlier, but um, another option that is available to states that is in the law in 2017 is for you to design your own health care system to take in all of the uh, revenues that are coming in, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the uh, uh, premium tax credits through the exchanges. I think someone uh, raised that earlier is um, you can, if, if you can find a way to, you know, cover people and deliver the uh, same outcomes that, um, you know, the same price or lower, you can design your own program. Um, so you can take all those funds and spend them however you want. If, if you think at the state level, you know, you can, you can get better outcomes and you can, you can get lower costs. So when that 100% in the law runs out, you also have this option of saying, well, we're not going to participate in Medicaid and premium tax credits. We're taking control of the whole thing at the state level uh, and doing our own program. So that's another option that's available to you as well. It's, it's that, yeah, it's actually built into the law. It's called the State Innovation Waiver. So it's not a Medicaid 1115 waiver. It's called the State Innovation Waiver. Yeah. And the, the basic provisions of that is you're saying, we're going to do it better. Do you see that streamlining at all uh, based upon the conversation from another gentleman earlier? Because we applied for that waiver months and months and months ahead of time. And when we run a two-year budget in the state of Iowa, that put the legislature, the governor, and frankly, your office in precarious positions to whether or not we we're going to get her or not. Well, as I recall, we, uh, from the time the legislation was passed until the waiver was approved and the coverage expansion began, it was about eight months, six or eight months uh, for, for Iowa. Um, that wasn't all just on our side. It required a lot of work of the state as well. Um, so we actually did, we were able to approve what was a, you know, rather new and innovative waiver um, in, I think, you know, what everyone who's had experience with waivers uh, before would agree was a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic, uh, dramatically quick time frame. We, we hit the deadlines laid out by the state in your waiver. So I think that's a pretty good precedent. All right. Thank you. As you can tell, these are very, very complex issues and 
the purpose of this academy is to give you the opportunity to interact with folks and ask questions and I think everybody's made some really good points. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to introduce Deb Miller if you haven't met her. Uh, Deb has been instrumental in putting this uh, policy academy together. Uh, she is the one who thought of the idea two or three years ago to uh, bring us the kind of information to legislators, especially new legislators. And I'd like to introduce her and thank her for doing such a great job. And she's going to introduce some other speakers. Deb. Thank you. Um, glad to see all you here. I have one more, one housekeeping thing. As we've said, we have optional small group dinners tonight. I need you to sign the paper before 5 o'clock because we need to let restaurants know how many folks are coming. And I would hate for you to come and not have a place set for you. So do that before you leave. Um, Jennifer Snow, who works with Paul, has kindly agreed to give you her email address. And if you have further questions, as opposed to the email address that's on your speaker form that goes to the office, this is Jennifer's personal address. And it is Jennifer, spelled the normal way, dot snow, like the stuff that's not fallen out there today at hhs.gov, real straightforward email address, and she'll watch for your questions, and if you reference that you were here at the meeting, uh, she'll get an answer back to you. So that's a very generous offer. Thanks, Jennifer. We appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker, and we do have speaker bios in your notebook, so I'm not going to waste the time going through all, all um, uh, Robin's uh, credits, but I will say that Robin has spoken at every one of our Medicaid Policy Academy, so she's a regular at this point, and we really appreciate that. One of the things that Mike has told me in his experience as a Medicaid director, that when the Kaiser Commission sends out its annual questionnaire to Medicaid directors, that it is the one questionnaire that every Medicaid director is sure they fill out and get back that you don't ever want to show up as no data available in the report that Robin and her colleagues issue every year on the status of, of Medicaid. So she really is an expert on what's going on in everybody's state every year. She has a variety of experience where she's worked at the federal level, she's worked at the congressional level, she's worked at the state level. So she brings just a vast array of experience and knowledge about what's going, in, going on on in Medicaid. We've asked her to do some basic walkthrough information, but she was also here to listen to your questions, so I suspect that uh, being fleet on her feet, as I know she is, uh, she'll try and answer your questions as well. So here's Robin. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me again. I actually did not realize until um, uh, the introduction that I have been here for every one of these um, work groups. And that first one was a doozy with the Supreme Court. And I think it's always interesting times um, thinking about uh, the Medicaid program. There's always interesting things going on. It's really dynamic, always evolving. So it's um, a pleasure to be here. And it's always great to talk to state policymakers. My heart and um, background is in state government, and um, that's clearly where a lot of decisions are getting um, made, where um, Medicaid program is implemented and administered every day. Um, so it's great to be here. So I'm glad that Paul answered all the really difficult questions, so I just get to provide some national perspective and overview. <laughs> um, so I'm sure there's a, um, so I'm going to run through the set of slides pretty quickly. It seems like um, I always do a sort of overview to make sure everyone's on the same page and again provide sort of a national context um, 
for what's going on in the program, and then I'll move quickly through so we can get to, um, get to questions. Um, but I always think it's important to remind people Medicaid's role in the overall health care system, um, as well as state budgets. Um, when you look at total health expenditures and coverage, Medicaid represents about 16% of both on the coverage side and on the health spending side. Um, so, um, and it's also important reminder how many roles really Medicaid has in the overall healthcare system. I think we always focus on the healthcare coverage component, um, and that is certainly one of the um, key and primary roles of the Medicaid program. It's also really important to understand that Medicaid provides a lot of assistance to Medicare beneficiaries, really making the Medicare program work. Um, by providing long-term care services, um, particularly that the Medicare program does not provide. Um, it's a lot of support for safety net providers um, in states, so safety net hospitals, um, clinics really rely on Medicaid financing both through patient revenue um, as well as supplemental payments. And of course it's state capacity in providing those matching dollars to state governments in terms of the match rate and then of course the additional dollars for states that are expanding. Um, Medicaid also provides a really critical role for um, key populations. One in three kids are covered by Medicaid and CHIP um, across the country. Over um, four in ten births are paid for by the Medicaid program. Um, you know, the majority of people with HIV AIDS are covered by Medicaid as well as people living in nursing homes. So there are particular populations that really rely heavily on this program. Um, when you look at how Medicaid spends its dollars, and this was touched on a little bit um, before, it's mostly on acute care spending, but a good chunk on long-term care spending. Um, there's uh, over one in four dollars are spent on payments to managed care companies, um, and that's a growing share of Medicaid. So you see sort of a shift in spending over time from, you know, individual from hospital categories of hospitals and physician payments to managed care organizations, and I think that's affecting long-term care spending. Too too, as um, states are implementing managed long-term care. So it's really important to keep our eye on what's happening with that and um, it's certainly been a growing piece of Medicaid budgets. Um, Medicaid spending, I don't think I've ever done a presentation without this um, double bar here. And again, most people understand this, but it's a really important reminder that um, when we look at Medicaid enrollees, the majority of Medicaid enrollees are kids and parents. Um, they represent a pretty small fraction of the spending. Um, the elderly and um, individuals with disabilities really represent um, the majority of spending. This picture, actually, when you look at the CBO projections over time, um, evolves over time when, with the increase in the adults on the program due to the ACA. Um, so it's you know more adults than the 27%. Um, so the shift in spending does um, shift a bit going over time. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, and we just talked, a, you know, there was some discussion about this, but Medicaid financing is shared by the states and the federal government based on this match rate. Um, the formula for the match rate is set in the law, um, and it's based on state per capita income, so poorer states have a higher federal contribution. Um, this is for the standard Medicaid program, the underlying basics of the program, and not the ACA. Um, and um, we use NASBO data to always look at um, Medicaid's role in state governments. So um, when you look at total spending, Medicaid represents one in four dollars that states spend in total. But it's also really important to remember because of that matching um, nature of the program, Medicaid is the largest source of federal revenues um, coming into the states. So it's a budget item as well as a revenue item um, for states. And when you look at spending over time, you know, Medicaid is really um, a counter-cyclical program. So during economic downturns, when individuals lose their jobs and income, more people qualify for the program, and the enrollment is really the primary driver of, um, of Medicaid spending. So you see real spikes in enrollment and spending during the last two major economic downturns that we've seen um, over the last decade. For 2014, um, as Deborah mentioned, we do this survey of all the Medicaid directors each year. We're just out in the field. We just sent the survey out to be collecting data. But last year, we collected data on what happened in 2013 and what states were expecting for 2014. So you do see increases in both spending and enrollment 
um, again, tied to what um, states were predicting with the ACA, and that was including states' assessments. This is a combination of states, both moving forward and not moving forward um, with the expansion. There is definitely a lot of interest, I think, in um, what states are doing around delivery system reform. Um, so I have a few slides that sort of have a snapshot of what's happening here. Right now, about two-thirds of all beneficiaries are in some type of managed care arrangement. So the 66% represents both fully capitated managed care um, uh, arrangements as well as PCCM, so these primary care case management, about 50% of all enrollees are in ma fully capitated managed care plans. It's been largely for adults and children, but states are increasingly moving to um, expand both the geographic area that managed care covers in their states as well as um, um, as well as different populations. So populations that might have been excluded from managed care, um, states are looking at you know, moving the, those populations into managed care. So there's a lot of activity going on here. I think every state in the country is doing something on managed care or care coordination. It's, um, when you talk about cost savings um, due to the economic downturns, most states, if there was something easy to do, They've already done it in terms of cost savings. So um, there's just an enormous focus on delivery system reform and how to improve care and control costs at the same time. So we try to capture some of that in our survey. Um, so 35 states were doing something new in managed care last year. Um, you know, so many states have already expanded managed care. So what we're seeing really now is increasingly adding more groups um, to who's covered in managed care, as well as this whole last category on quality. Um, so that includes additional pay for performance, um, looking at quality metrics, so expecting more for what um, states are doing with managed care, um, maybe withholding some payments until managed care companies uh, achieve those metrics. So there's just a lot of activity um, going on here. And again, we'll continue to look at that in, um, in this year's survey. Did that? No, there we go. Um, there's also a great deal of activity. You know, some states are moving in the other direction. They're abandoning managed care, or moving um, much more heavily into other types of care coordination. Um, so again, 33 states are doing something in this area. These are from our survey last year, but particularly around health homes, so this new option that was included in the ACA. And again, this slide has old data, but as of today, there are 22 health home programs that have been approved in 15 states. So some states have more than one um, health home that's approved. And these are um, real care coordination focused on complex populations. So um, real activity, again, that's where the costs are. That's where care needs to be better integrated and improved. Um, so there's a lot of activity there, um, as well as, again, a focus on quality and getting better value for the dollar spent. Um, I don't have another slide on this area, but I want to talk about a few other major delivery system reform efforts that are going on. Um, I think Paul mentioned one of them, so these SIM grants, the state innovation waivers that are, um, that are going on. 25 states already have some type of innovation model grant, and phase two was just released, so states will be thinking about those. These are not just Medicaid, but all payers. Um, so looking more broadly at delivery system. Um, other folks talked about the duels. So there's just a lot of activity going on with individuals who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So there are now 13 demos that have been approved for the duels um, in 12 states. Washington state has two demos that are going on. Um, so again, there's a lot of activity around looking at be ways to better integrate and improve care for the duels as well as achieve some types of cost savings. Um, there's also these um, uh, new DISRIP waivers that, well, not so new in some states, but a new um, type of waiver that some states are um, looking at in terms of using dollars for safety net providers um, to generate 
really tie how the money is spent to outcomes and metrics that are measurable over time. So I just think that there is an enormous amount going on in this area and um, hard to summarize all of these um, things happening at, uh, in one slide, but happy to talk more about them. So I wanted to move to the ACA. Um, so of course, as we know, the goal of the ACA was to make coverage available, reliable, and affordable to a vast number of people. Medicaid was designed to be the foundation of coverage for low-income people. Um, and it really builds on what Medicaid has been um, doing for, you know, since its enactment. So it expands its role in terms of health coverage. The shared financing exists, and there's um, provisions in the law, of course, to enhance that financing for the expansion. Um, assistance for the duals and long-term care. So there are these, the new office for Medicare and Medicaid services to look at the coordination of, for duals as well as some other options on long-term care services um, uh, for these populations, um, and lots of new um, grants and opportunities for delivery system reform. Um, so I think I presented this slide before, but really what the ACA did in a picture is expand the umbrella of coverage um, for the Medicaid population um, to include nearly all adults under 138% of the poverty level. So that's what it was um, designed to do in terms of coverage. I think the other really important and transformative thing that the ACA did for Medicaid was um, really transform how eligibility works. Um, so regardless of if a state is moving forward or not moving forward with the Medicaid expansion, all states were really required to transform how um, individuals are enroll in coverage. So, you know, in the past, just you might have had to apply in person, lots of paper documentation. Um, it might have taken a long time um, to wait for your eligibility determination. So the vision was really to coordinate eligibility determinations across health programs, have much more reliance on um, income and other verification through data matching, um, and make eligibility determinations much more seamless and streamlined. Of course, states are in various places of how um, that vision is uh, being achieved. But again, this is something that's happening um, across the country. Um, again, I think the ACA just has so many implications across um, the federal and state budgets and, you know, for people and budgets, and um, we tried to boil that all down to one picture. Um, so there's a lot of money out there, um, some state dollars and federal dollars. Overall, the goal was to reduce the number of uninsured. There are certainly implications for providers in terms of um, providers and their expected revenue streams. Um, within state budgets, um, states that do move forward with the expansion might be able to achieve some other savings. Um, so I think someone talked about this earlier. If you have a state-funded program for indigent care, you know, those individuals might be newly eligible for coverage, so you might not be able, you might not need that program anymore. So lots of shifting around um, of how um, care and services are delivered. Um, and many states have anticipated broader economic effects related to, um, related to coverage both through Medicaid expansion and through the ACA with um, additional jobs in the healthcare sector. Um, um, and productivity and all sorts of um, other broader economic effects. Um, of course, not all states are moving forward with the Medicaid expansion. We just updated um, this map, so we now have 27 states, including D.C., that are actively moving forward with the expansion. Um, we have three states that are still in open debate, and this is Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Utah. And these are states that are in active negotiation with the federal government over um, a pending waiver or, you know, developing a waiver. Um, and we always say um, states not moving forward at this time because there was some discussion again of this, that states really don't, um, there's no time limit about whether states come in or um, leave the expansion. Um, but the only thing that's set in the law is the match rates. So if a state comes in and um, next year, then they would only get, um, you know, the two years instead of three of the 100% um, of the 100% match rate. Um, for states that don't move forward with coverage, um, it's important to um, 
the individuals below 100% of the poverty level um, fall into a coverage gap generally. So Medicaid levels for adults have typically been um, pretty low. They've been pretty high for kids um, through Medicaid and SHIP, but for parents. And most states without a waiver, just you know, if you're an adult, someone asked about the categories of coverage, but if you're a non-disabled adult um, without, um, without children, you virtually had no pathway um, to coverage through Medicaid um, prior to the ACA. So there's a large gap for, for those people. Um, we've done a bunch of analysis about who falls into the gap. Um, six in ten live in five states with large populations, obviously, um, and eight in ten of those people in this coverage gap live in the south. Um, CMS has put out a bunch of data, um, and we're still working through a lot of the data that they're putting out, but um, We've never had such current <laughs> data on Medicaid enrollment. I think we're still really working with 2011 um, detailed data, so to have almost real-time um, data is a very new phenomena. But they've been tracking how many people were enrolled um, during, before open enrollment, so this average between um, July, August, and September, to the latest data that they put out is um, April. Um, so uh, six million people on net have um, been added to the Medicaid program, and there's been much higher growth in Medicaid enrollment in states that are implementing coverage um, through the Medicaid expansion. Um, we focus a lot on coverage because coverage means access to care. So um, data shows that individuals with Medicaid coverage have much better access to care um, compared to those who are uninsured, both children and adults are much more likely to be able to see a physician, um, get their care when they need it, um, and not go without, um, without needed care. Um, we also tend to focus on people at Kaiser. So, um, you know, we did some uh, focus groups of individuals who didn't have coverage and what that means and individuals that had newly gained coverage. Um, it's... It, it, people without insurance coverage, it's not just that they just can't get um, the health coverage that they need. Um, they had pretty broad ramifications for their ability to work and um, uh, do other, um, other things, not just, you know, not just their health care. So I managed to almost get through this without coughing because <laughs> um, I've had a bad cough. Um, so, I, you know, we're just, there's so many things, I think, so many moving parts, and we'll just continue to keep watching what states are doing around the expansion, what's happening with eligibility and enrollment systems, because, you know, these have been huge changes for states. I mean, really um, transformative changes. Um, what this all means for the uninsured, you know, um, those will be, um, we'll be looking at that data. We're trying to understand the ramifications for state budgets. So we have a few projects looking at that. Um, we're, you know, we're really interested in what states are doing around delivery system and payment reforms um, and how that translates to access to care and um, care outcomes. Um, and, you know, there's just an endless amount of work, I think, to continue um, to continue to do. So um, I am happy to answer any of those easy questions that no one asked, <laughs> that everyone saved for me and asked the hard questions to Paul. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we have um, a bunch of great reports that try to accumulate a lot of that data. We have better um, uh, information and collected studies on kids um, because there's been more coverage for, um, for kids. Um, so we do have <laughs> a number of pieces that I, I can share with you on reduced asthma, better school attendance, um, things like that. And I think we also have some great briefs that sort of try to disentangle um, the results of Oregon because um, I, I think part of the, they did show significant um, 
significant benefits um, related to depression and mental health issues. They did not show, as you said, um, significant impact on things like cholesterol and heart disease. Um, and that, I think, was the thing that got picked up most. Um, but I think it was hard to assess that in the two-year window. You know, these are things that I think need to be looked at um, further over time. So there was no change. Um, but, you know, so that is what um, I think got picked up a lot. But I think um, there were some significant changes on mental health and depression, um, as well as financial um, liability. So individuals that had coverage had much um, uh, better financial protections. And I think we need to continue to watch what happens with um, some other outcomes on um, heart disease, cholesterol. Um, but those are things even with private insurance that I probably, you know, you might not see a change over the population in, um, in a two-year span. But if I get your information, I'm happy to send you those, um, that stuff. Yeah. I just have a question. One of your first slides um, had a breakdown in the amount that's spent, and it said 0.8% for mental health. It was mm -hmm. like just one of the first ones, like number five. <coughs> we don't have a breakout for mental health. Um, whoops. <coughs> whoops. <laughs> Oh, mental health. I wonder. Oh, that's, you know, that's probably um, should be labeled better. That's ICFMR spending, I think. Um, so for mental institutions. Um, so that's a good point. We should. Not only that's. Like just like the cure that they're getting for mental health. Yeah. So this is only a very small piece of what Medicaid spends on mental health. It's for um, institutional care. And I think it's been, Medicaid is the largest payer for mental health services, um, public payer for mental health services. And it's really hard to find um, total picture of mental health spending because it's going to physicians, it's going to other practitioners. So this is a very small slice of institutional mental health spending. Um, and it's harder to disentangle mental health spending um, in the larger picture because you can't separate it out um, from a physician payment. You know, you can't tell what's a, ma a mental health issue. Okay, are there any studies of who the users are of Medicaid? And I'm sp specifically looking at like, their mental health issues, the background, um, that that's why they're on Medicaid. You know, they're not finding jobs because of other issues. Um, yes. I mean, within the individuals who qualify based on their disability status, I believe there is information. And again, I'd have to double check. But I don't think we know globally, but individuals that qualify based on their disability, I think we have some ability to disentangle um, how many of those are qualifying based on a mental health diagnosis, but um, more broadly, and I think it's an issue with the expansion too, because a lot of individuals um, who might be newly eligible in states that are moving forward um, might have significant mental health issues. So, um, but we might know on the disability, you know, just on the disability qualifying. The number of people? Yeah, so the clients. So it would be different because two thirds of the states doing some form of managed care doesn't give you the idea of really how many. It's just because our state is just embarking on that now. Mm -hmm. You know, we would have thought that no other state was doing it almost. So when I see that two thirds of all the states were doing it, I mean, I knew several were, but I just wondered what <coughs> Yeah, so this is um, enrollees. This is not of states. So this is the percentage of enrollees in states. So, you know, there are some states. Um, so for Illinois, we're showing, you know, in the 66 state. But again, this is also PCCM. Um, so it's not just capitated managed care. Um, overall, yeah. Yeah, now let me 
pull together. My, we don't do projections, um, so um, but we just put out a brief on the um, uh, looking at what the uh, Congressional Budget Office projects um, in terms of um, enrollment and costs. So. Um, Back to that discussion from earlier. So the CBO has recently said that they will no longer keep track of the, the overall effect of the ACA. So originally when it was scored, it did, um, um, it, it was, um, had positive implications for the deficit. So um, uh, it reduced the deficit, the whole bill. Um, they have not scored many of the other provisions, like they don't keep scoring those each year, but they have continued to update the coverage um, estimates related to the ACA, so in terms of um, coverage and expenditures. So, and, but they look at mostly the federal um, expenditures. It's something like over 700, oh, do you have the CBO estimates from our brief? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's higher than that's that's higher than CBO. Yeah, and I'm also happy to send you the, the CBO estimates as well as our brief on the CBO numbers. So, and that was, I think, just to come back to that discussion from earlier, the Congressional Budget Office, so they do projections of um, uh, federal spending and what will happen, um, assuming current law. So over time, um, they have adjusted those projections to assume that not all states are doing the expansion. So I think that there was some discussion about that earlier, about where the money goes and doesn't go. But, you know, in these projections, they've already assumed that, you know, not all states will be implementing the expansion. So that's factored into both their coverage as well as their cost estimates. Um, I thought it was like, I thought it was 12 million in 2016 and like something like 700 billion over in federal spending over the 10-year um, period um, for the Medicaid side. They've actually just reduced their estimate for state spending. So CBO doesn't really do state estimates, but they've always had this footnote in their estimates about how much the coverage expansion would implicate, you know, would, how that would affect states. And they had always assumed it was about $70 billion over the 10-year period across all states. And in their um, April update that they just put out, they reduced that by almost half to $46 billion, um, you know, for a number of complex reasons that um, they are not assuming as many current enrollees come onto the program um, and that the costs for the new enrollees are a little bit less, but that was the first time that they significantly reduced that, and it's like just in the footnote under their estimates. Yes? I have two questions that are totally disassociated with each other. Well, one of them has to do with a slide, I think, two slides that are a little further than this. Um, so forward, there's one you were looking at the percentage of states who have enrolled versus not enrolled. So oh, okay. Yep. Right here, um, the curiosity I had was uh, non adults below the far, um, if the South is at 79%, but when you've been back and you look at the states who have not asked for help yet, most of those states are in the South. Yeah, so this, is, yeah, so this is individuals who fall into the coverage gap. So these are individuals who, um, if the state is not moving forward with the Medicaid expansion, um, and if you're not, so if you're below poverty um, and you're above for a parent, the current Medicaid, ex, you know, current Medicaid coverage level, there's essentially no um, coverage option for these individuals. So um, we've done a lot of analysis to estimate that this affects about nearly 5 million people. Um, so these are individuals who don't have a new coverage option because this set of states is um, is not moving forward with the expansion. Right. So I, I think the follow-on question that you don't have to answer right now, the follow-on question is, what is the impact of that? You don't have to answer that right now. The second question is, some of the folks that I deal with are students, um, college students, and they are much more knowledgeable about what this is going to have an impact on them than what we would probably think, as politicians, what we would probably think. Um, they are very much aware of what the cost is going to be to them long term. There are 
same time, is associated with Medicare, they're also very much aware that their college education debt is something that they're not going to be able to avoid because of the federal government's policies about, about student debt in this lifetime. So they're looking at this federal debt aid that's sitting out there for education. They're looking at this growing health care bill that's coming, and they're wondering, what's in it for us? Where do we go with this? And as politicians, we're looking at these kids right now that I'm talking about are probably 21 years old, 22 maybe, 21, 22 years old. So in 10 years, what these guys are projecting 10 years out, in 10 years, this guy's going to be voting in a pretty good block. We may not be here, some of us, as politicians. What does that have for politics? Where are we going with this? It's not going to be sustainable by any measure. It's not going to be sustainable. How do we tell young people to keep the faith? I think that's beyond my, the, um, the scope of what I get. But I mean, I do think there's been a lot of, um, you know, focus on the overall federal budget deficit. And I feel like there's been this somewhat brief hiatus, maybe because everyone was so exasperated of, with dealing with the debt limit and yeah, these. Because we have to deal with that. Right, right. No, I mean. Yeah, no, I think ultimately these issues around the federal deficit and, um, you know, uh, longer term spending, looking at, you know, bring, looking at Medicare, looking at revenues, um, uh, you know, that needs to come back around, um, you know, particularly to federal policymakers. But um, I think the appetite to do that um, after the last few rounds of, you um, um, and the sequester and, um, you know, dealing with the debt limit increases and tying that to a various federal budget deficit um, uh, changes. You know, there's um, now been some brief hiatus in, uh, in that intense focus, but, you know, I do believe that has got to come back around. Yes. Is there any data? With the federal hub, um, <coughs> um, that is, <coughs> I guess, a good question. Um, you know, I, I believe that um, you know this will be this long-term focus on uh, looking at eligibility, and I'm sure, um, and I think I've heard that GAO and OIG are doing lots of. Um, lots of work around um, around looking at that. Um, so, you know, I think it has been working in some states um, with their state exchanges. The way that the applications have been flowing between Medica Medicaid and the exchange, like, you know, in states that are relying on the uh, federally facilitated marketplace, and then those that data is going to the states. We're still seeing issues with those files and the account transfers and how that's working so it's unclear you know why the data is you know what's happening with that data why maybe it was a you know it went through on the federal hub and it's not matching state data sources so um i don't have a great answer on that but i think um you, you know i think there'll be a lot more focus and investigation on that um and i think um yeah so I don't have a. Yeah, I mean, I think it's come to light some of these issues with what's getting inputted and how it's getting, you know, with some states that are relying on the federally facilitated marketplace and how those, how it's working with Medicaid. You know, what's happening? Why are those? Um, some states are saying that the data is not good, it's not matching their state data. So I think we're still trying to understand that. States are still working through some of their backlogs. I mean, clearly systems weren't working, you know, and the transfers weren't working as well as they could. So it's unclear whether it's there are problems with the data verification, there's problems with the systems being able to accept the applications, you know. Um, in some states, it's working quite well, and data is being transferred and working. But in other states, you know, so I think we need to work through or continue to uh, try to understand what's happening there. Am I done? <laughs> sure, I'm. A, uh, I, no, actually, I, know I love um, <laughs> questions in an engaged audience, so I hate to. Well, I know also Robin has like a child picture. Yeah. 
make up obligation, and I don't want to be responsible for some child being put on the sidewalk. <laughs> so then I saw two more hands. Let's take your two questions. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so, well, Paul said that we'd like a second opinion, I would like a second opinion. The, the CBO estimate that originally said that the whole ACA was going to reduce the deficit, and that was based on Still by what he, he was very emphatic that those original projections are good. And I think what you were saying is that CBO has announced that they're not going to continue to rescore that. Oh, yeah, they never have rescored the full bill. Correct. So they've never, you know, um, but all of those provisions, you know, they score and they do baseline projections of current law. So it becomes hard to disentangle like what. Um, you know, how well, a specific so provision. I would wager 60% of Americans don't never believe that that was the case, that it was smoke and mirrors. I bet in this room, bipartisan basis, we don't believe it's the case. I'm, I'm asking you, you've studied <laughs> this a lot. Do you really believe that this is reducing the deficit and not adding to the deficit? Yeah, I mean, I I can't answer that question, but I do know, um, again, we just put out this brief looking at the CBO estimates over time um, on the Medicaid side, and there's also, you know, broader um, on the health care spending. Um, federal projections for spending on health care have been coming down. Um, you know, it's unclear if that's related to the recession. It's unclear if that's related to some fundamental changes in the way care and, you uh, care is delivered and how it's paid for. Um, but over time, you know, and part of that reduction on the Medicaid side was the original projections include, you know, assumed all states would move forward. So after the Supreme Court, there was a big reduction in Medicaid um, expenditures because, you know, CBO had to adjust their baseline to assume that not all states. But even after that, there have been consistent um, reductions over time, reduced to reductions in per enrollee spending, um, reductions, continual reductions on Medicare spending. So, um, you know, and these are current law projection spending. So that includes both the ACA adjustments on, you know, the economy and all the other things that they factor into those. So, um, so those are what their projections are and they don't, release so much detail on how, you know, on how they do those, but they have been coming down over time. But I would encourage also everyone to look at the website. It's really easy. It's kff.org. And we, um, not me, because I don't focus primarily on those issues, but another colleague has done a lot of great fact sheets and synopses of all of the uh, duels waivers that have been um, initiatives that have been approved so far and all their progress. So we do a lot of work in that area. Okay. <laughs>
the most recent of which is in your notebook as a resource. Um, I think it came out, the ink may not be dry on it yet, except that now everything's digital, so there is no ink to dry. Um, but Stacy's here. Stacy has also spoken every year at the Medicaid Policy Academy, including, I think she came on like, you know, maybe half a day after the Supreme Court decision dropped two years ago, and we were peppering her with questions about what it would mean. Um, but maybe the answers today will be a little easier for to your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's always hard to be the last speaker and right before dinner, so I, I'm very mindful of that. I, w I won't drone on and on. And just really wanted to, like Robin did, give you a, a, an overview of some slides, and then we can reserve the, the rest of the time for just, you know, questions and answers or maybe questions. I'm not sure I'll have all the answers or anything. But I uh, just wanted to sort of give you an overview. And as, and, and as, um, as mentioned, we did just release the fiscal survey of states, which all your states contribute to. And it, and it provides a really good overview to just sort of a snapshot of what's going on with, with state fiscal conditions. And it just came out less than a week ago. Um, but of course, it's focused on governor's proposed budget. So you're sitting there saying, yeah, but we passed our budget. But that will be uh, compiled in about December. So anyway, but I think it gives you a good, a good view of where states are in a, in, you know, fiscally and how health care fits into the picture. So what I wanted to do today was just give a sort of a current state fiscal conditions and then also the Medicaid and health care trends. What we're seeing initially from the Affordable Care Act uh, we have some numbers in our fiscal survey. In the spring edition, we do a little bit of a snapshot there. And then also the major budget challenges moving forward, and um, they always include health care. I mean, that's sort of a given, and particularly now with, with so many moving parts. So just to give you an idea of what's going on with the um, sort of state fiscal conditions, the good news is that we're now in the fifth year of positive growth, so that's really good, good news. Now what we're saying is it's still a little bit below what we, we've historically seen. We've seen the 5.5% over the 37 years we've been doing this. And uh, we're really, for governor's proposed budgets, it was a little under 3%. And then the year prior, it was about five. So averaging about 4% those years, which is really below the historical average. But on the other hand, we do have low inflation. So, you know, that's, that's really positive news. And just also, uh, we do see much more budget stability. We have fewer states having to go in and, and really reduce their current, you know, their inactive budgets. Uh, only eight states and 14. There's always some states for various reasons. It may not always be the economy. And the numbers were about a billion. So that's, you know, that's pretty good, relatively speaking, to like the peaks we saw during the recession. And also states have been able to build up their reserve funds. Um, you know, these are aggregate numbers. They're, they look a little bit better um, on an aggregate basis because we have uh, Texas and uh, Alaska in there. And without those states, we have their, the average is about 3% for all the states in 15. But nevertheless, um, states have been sort of building them up and spending them down a little bit in 15. Now I know, you know, you all are so aware of state finances, but some people look and, you know, even during the recession, states didn't go to zero. But, you know, for, for various reasons, I mean, there was this very much the scare when the credit markets froze, uh, you know, in, in that situation. And also states need it for, you know, the revenues do not come in in an even pattern. So you need to have some reserves. It's just really prudent. And just to give you a picture, uh, sort of an idea of how Medicaid fits into the budget, I know there's been discussion throughout the, the afternoon on, you know, Medicaid as a percentage of your budget. These are aggregate numbers, and our state expenditure report, which is on our website, has every state's uh, percentages. This is how it sort of comes up when you look at them all together. And it's 19% when we just look at the general fund, but 24.4% all funds. That would include the federal funds, state funds, which is a little bit of a mystery sometimes. It uh, could be provider taxes, other matching funds. But, um, you know, it's just a, it's a very significant part of state budgets. And even, uh, you know, that's why anything that happens in the program can really throw your budget out of whack. 
I mean, we certainly see that with the state budget directors that you cannot ignore the Medicaid program. And I think sometimes, you know, when the Medicaid director comes in their office or they discuss things, it's, you know, it's, it's not always good news. So, um, but anyway, it's, it's just a really significant part of, of your budget all the time. And in the fiscal survey we just put out last week, these were some numbers we looked at in terms of all the states reporting sort of the averages and I mean not surprisingly with you know virtually half the states coming going forward with the expansion we saw a big increase in the federal fund rate uh, for 14 and for 15 recommended and a big increase in enrollment now the thing that we were a little bit surprised about is the state fund piece which is close to six percent in um, both years and that does include general funds and what we call other state funds but even though you know there's been a lot of discussion of bending the health care cost curve and we've seen some some good numbers relatively speaking but really what we look at is how does that compare to your revenue growth I mean that's really the relevant comparison and even with that we talked about the CMS actuarial report uh, they do a, a very nice job it's very detailed and they also look at their projections of Medicaid uh, all, all, from all sources, 7.1% compared to GDP growth of 5.1%. So I think when you look forward, you know, in terms of your budget, what's the difference between your underlying revenue growth and your health care costs? And, you know, health care has been coming down, relatively speaking, and as Robin referenced, there's a lot of debate whether this is from the recession, it will pick up again, um, have there been fundamental changes? Paul talked about some of the changes with the Affordable Care Act and delivery changes. I mean, I think the feeling is that even, um, you know, the promising, uh, you know, aspects of that, those things take time. So it will be very, very interesting to look at, and it's really one of those things that makes or breaks your budget whether you've expanded Medicaid or not, um, this sort of differential here. Now, um, also some of the things we looked at in this fiscal survey, and it's, you know, everything's available on our website, and we may have some summaries in the, in the booklet as well. Um, we saw, you know, more states increasing provider payments than decreasing them. And we certainly see that when the economy is really bad, you know, in the heart of the recession, like every state reduces provider payments. So we had more states coming and increasing them versus reducing them. And some of it's from the primary care uh, provider increase that uh, the federal government paid for for two years to get up to the Medicare rates. Uh, some of that's probably in that number as well. We also, we talked a lot about expansion of managed care. I mean, this is definitely a phenomenon and also bringing in other populations, just not the, you know, the women and children who have traditionally been in it. Uh, we've seen the shift, we talked about long-term care, the ongoing shift to home and community-based services. Um, we've actually, CBO really lowered their, significantly lowered their projection of long-term care costs. And I think it's part of this movement. I guess the question is how long it's going to continue. So it's definitely something uh, to be watching as well. The enhanced program integrity, um, that's certainly, it's sort of hard to say you're not doing that. <laughs> and there's been a lot of federal programs to promote that as well. Um, and then limit on prescription drugs. Um, this is one uh, discussion that hasn't come up as much uh, today so far, but um, states are trying to do that with provider lists and whatnot, but there's certainly been so much press lately on the hepatitis C drugs, the specialty drugs, you know, as the some, you know, the Lipitor's moved off of into generic, uh, then you also ha now have these specialty drugs, and it's different for some diseases where you don't have that many people with the affliction, but something like the hepatitis C is huge, so not only affecting your Medicaid, but your prison population. Relations. Um, so I, I think that's still being debated, what you're able to do, what's appropriate to do. The health care plans are certainly uh, sent a letter to OMB, for instance, to have a special analysis in their mid-session review just for the impact of Solvati, um, you know, on, on government costs. So that's something I'd be, you know, sort of curious from all of you where, where you know, what the debate is going on in your state on that. And um, we, we talked, you know, we talked, I think, throughout the day. So these numbers are shifting slightly, but not too much. But that's sort of where, where we were as of a couple weeks ago. 
And then um, we also put out something called the Healthcare Toolkit, and, and we have a copy in our, our, our um, the materials today as well. And it was really a way to look for budget officers or legislators to, you know, to keep a focus on what the big issues are. And we sort of divided them into healthcare costs, what's going on with that, managed care, exchanges, although a lot of you people, a lot of people are moving out of them versus in these days, at least doing a state-based, um, what's going on with payment delivery. And um, if you're expanding Medicaid, what are the questions to look at? What are your costs? Are you newly eligible? What are you seeing in other aspects of your programs? Um, there's been also a lot of attention to whether you've expanded or not. What's the impact of the woodwork or welcome mat effect? You know, and we've seen uh, you know states that haven't expanded. People are still in the state who are eligible for Medicaid and are coming on board at the current match rate. So. That's been something where, you know, California, for instance, put a, I don't know, a billion and a half more into the budget because of the woodwork effect. Uh, Rhode Island um, was surprised that their estimates were higher than anticipated. I know a question came up earlier about Medicaid projections, and um, that's always a really interesting topic, and we're probably going to have a call with some of our members just to talk about that because, it's, you know, it's just always a mystery. It's sort of like projecting capital gains or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's always challenging, and I think in this turbulent world, it's even more challenging. And then a little bit of the reference of, you know, with the managed care, coordinated care, et cetera, what's going to be the impact over time in quality and, and costs? And um, certainly, you know, keep our eyes on all of those. And, you know, we talked a little bit about it, and Robin referenced that, really every state's doing something. And I think sometimes you're in groups where, oh, they've expanded, they haven't. Well, it doesn't matter if you've expanded Medicaid or not. Everyone, every state is really making changes in their service and delivery in some form or another. And just, you know, we just had a couple of these examples, and there's certainly many more. I mean, Arkansas has gotten a lot of the uh, focus on how they've expanded Medicaid, but they're also doing their, you know, their health care payment initiative. Oregon, Paul mentioned Oregon in terms of the multi-year waiver, trying to get their, their costs below their baseline. And, um, and they said they'd rather talk about that than the exchange. <laughs> so uh, that, that's the situation there. And in New York, they have a very sort of a stringent global cap. Um, and they've also gotten, uh, received a, a, a very large waiver as well. And, and in some cases, in both of these, I think Oregon and New York, they're looking at being able to use more supportive services and having them eligible for Medicaid. And then, of course, having a lot of quality metrics and outcome measures that they're responsible for as part of um, the waiver. So just to sort of, you know, wrap it up, um, you know, as I said, we're seeing more stability, which is really good. Uh, not robust growth, but at least growth. And then, uh, you know, states are dealing with long-term liabilities in general. I mean, certainly it could be a retiree health care. I mean, GASB just came out with their, you know, proposed rules on how you account in your financial statements for your retiree health benefits. Uh, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on pensions. So those are all, you know, really top issues in, in so many of the states. And we talked a little bit about, you know, the commitment from the federal government. And, of course, no one can really know the future. Um, you know, states have, have been assessing this in terms of their decisions to expand or whatnot. But I think regardless of that, I mean, I don't think there's a sense that the federal government's going to be coming up with any, you know, large programs. And, um, you know, if commitments are capped, I mean, that's sort of the, the focus and that's the assumption. But, uh, you know, certainly not planning on, on additional programs. I know we had a lot of calls with our members during the various uh, shutdowns and, um, you know, just the so sort of uncertainty. And that what would that do to the market or whether the federal government would default and throw everything into a tizzy. So, you know, just hoping that there'd be stability and maybe not new money, but at least, uh, you know, commitments for current money. And then, you know, in terms of health care pressures, I mean, regardless of everything else, I think it's underlying costs um, and how that relates to your underlying revenue growth that really is, you know, really significant for your budgets. And, you know, we've seen this discussion of, you know, quote, have we bent the health care cost curve? I don't know. But um, it's certainly something that uh, we're 
keeping our eyes on and um, it really can make or break your budget. So uh, with that, I, you know, I don't know if there's any, uh, anything I can be helpful with beyond that, but anyway, it's been really a pleasure to be part of this discussion today. Are you talking about the CBO score or yeah, the, the um, score. yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, the, the CBO website, uh, the director has sort of a commentary on, on, on uh, you know, why they're not sort of looking at all aspects of the program and everything like that in terms of, it's, it's really hard to assess that larger program on and on the entire economy. Um, I think we'll see over time, you know, it's going to be hard to sort out, I guess, what's happening when you're in a program. You know, like, uh, you know, you don't really have a controlled experiment. You know, if healthcare costs come down a lot, that's going to be really a really good thing, whether it's because of aspects of the Affordable Care Act or um, changes outside of that. For instance, a lot of this work with the dual eligibles is not necessarily part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I know someone had a question about the duals. I mean, I would just reference, look at MACPAC. They have some really good reference materials as well in addition to Kaiser. Well, I, I mean, it's not decreasing in cost. I mean, I guess it's um, whether you're looking at, you know, if you're, if you're keeping your costs maybe rel in the same level as your whole budget, then your allocation may not be different. I think what we're seeing is, you know, historically we've seen healthcare costs grow faster than the economy or revenues, I mean, at all levels. So then it ends up being that you allocate more resources to maybe that set of services than something else unless you raise your taxes, for instance. Well, I, I don't know if, um, I, I mean, I think you're, I, I think it's really, really difficult to sort of make, um, I mean, there, people can make a, a, have an analysis. I'm not sure it's, you're ever going to sort of find out what's right or wrong just from that piece of it. I think, I think maybe in, in looking at what's happening with healthcare costs in general and, um, you know, some aspects maybe from the Affordable Care Act, I think it's going to be really hard to ferret out, I guess. Well, there's been, you know, some, some um, mixed experience. I mean, we, I think we had someone from Connecticut here who uh, was, I think, had, had some very good results. And in fact, I, the state of Maryland was looking at, at, at sort of getting into their system. But, um, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's concern also I, I've seen with some of the state-based exchanges of by 15, you have to be self-sustaining. And, you know, some of those states are a little bit concerned about how that's going to be paid for, you know, I mean, whether you increase your taxes on insurers and whatnot. So um, we don't see that many more jumping in. You know, I think Nevada was a state that's decided to go, go to the feds versus the state. Kentucky's one that seems happy to continue on. Um, but it's, it's a real challenge for states to, to operate that. I think a number of them thought there was maybe more risk than reward. I mean, there were so many, it's such a huge, it was such huge legislation, there was a lot of different pieces to it. For instance, there are, you know, there were new taxes on, um, I think it was uh, unearned income on a certain income group. There was the health insurance tax, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the health and uh, managed care plans are not happy about that because it raises the costs. Uh, there was tax on 
devices. So there were a lot of different pieces within the law to pay as well or to generate additional revenue. I mean, there's, you know, it's a very complicated law. Um, in terms of the exchanges, there were some startup money from the federal government for states that wanted to embark on a state-based exchange. And then after that, they had to be self-sustaining. So they had to raise money from insurers or use their general fund or whatever they wanted to do. But the, the grants would end. There's some states that are asking the federal government for an extension, not new money, but to extend the, the use of that money. So I, I, I guess it's, um, there's a lot, a lot of different pieces, but there were some elements of the law that tax, you know, were, were new taxes essentially too, or, or reductions for prov providers, for instance. That was part of it too, but on the flip side, the providers, you know, the, the reduction in disproportionate share payments is an example, but part of that was the decision thinking that, well, when people come on the program, they're going to be insured, so the hospitals will not be taking as much of a loss. So, you know, there were, there, there's various assumptions that go into it, but there were definitely reductions and new revenues as part of the legislation as well. Okay. <laughs> Any, anything else? Or? Well, in, in terms of what we're seeing in, I mean, what you pay providers, you know, is clearly part of it. Um, how many services are offered. I mean, a lot of it's, you know, that's why I think there's been the interest in going into some kind of managed care or coordinated care. Um, you know, the idea of reducing unnecessary services. For instance, you had a group of providers come up, I, I can't remember, using wisely or, I don't remember the exact slogan, but essentially it was providers saying, you know, if you have a backache, you shouldn't be running and getting an MRI all the time. Um, you know, so there's that aspect of sort of the view of what's really necessary. You know, maybe certain services really are not necessary. necessary. And then there's also been a focus, you know, for instance, we talked some about, you know, the Michigan example of um, expanding Medicaid and having an emphasis on healthy behaviors, you know, trying to do as much as you can. I mean, of course, we don't, you can't solve everything that way. But, you know, some aspects of trying to encourage healthy behavior and, you know, impact on um, health care costs. So, you know, those are just a few. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right, it's always a, a balance between, you know, how much people want to be, you know, what's dictated to you and what's encouraged. And I know in some of the, um, you know, I know I, I, Michigan is an example where at least they're trying to encourage, um, you know, people making, making good decisions, I guess, as much as you can. But um, there's always limits in what you, you know, can force people to do. <laughs> Five thousand one place and two thousand someplace else. 
Right, and, and there's been a lot with, you know, um, at the federal level, too, of these, you know, putting data out there. Um, and, and in states in general, in state budgets, there's been a lot of focus on transparency and having available information for people to make decisions or why is a certain operation so much more expensive this place versus that place. Yeah, I see a continued trend there just with, you know, the availability of information. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of that, sorry. This may not be a fair question. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Well, I know, for instance. Well, I know there's, you know, the the standard, the readmissions piece that's that's out there of, you know, if you get readmitted and, you know, you're penalized in terms of your reimbursements that way, it's Medicare. Um, but anyway, I I don't know all the direction that the federal government's going in, but certainly the readmission piece is something that's been, um, you know, a focal point. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs>